the first part um, will make the bridge from September's session number one and set the scene for the case study re uh, review of part two of today's session. Our first presenter is an engineer, a planner, a practitioner with over 35 years experience. His career focus has been on watershed management and sustainable land development. He's the program co coordinator with the Water Sustainability Action Plan. And I've got a little bit of a uh, career tidbit here on his bio. Um, he has received international recognition for his pioneering efforts related to rainwater management, water conservation, and smart land development, and has been invited to speak on the British Columbia experience and make keynote presentations at forums in Australia and throughout North America. So, without more ado, please welcome our guru and mentor, Kim Stevens.
to start. You can hear it's okay in the back. Yeah, I don't hear the microphone. All right, I, I'm with the Ministry of Community Development, uh, and I work uh, in the infrastructure and engineering department there. Um, so just a little bit about the Water Smart. I, mean, I, I guess one of the things I wanted to do was sort of articulate that this this is a, a provincial strategy. And when I say provincial strategy, it means that it's not a Ministry of Environment strategy, and uh, it's not a provincial government strategy, but it is a provincial strategy. And I think I think with it. Uh, you know, we've got to look at it as uh, some shared responsibility, and it's not only the province, and it's not only uh, local governments, but it's, it's actual individuals as well. Um, and I think another thing is to identify that, you know, it is one strategy, and there's a number of strategies out there. I, I usually refer to the Climate Action Plan as well, which uh, uh, together with the Living Smart strategy and some of the other strategies out, th out there actually looks at uh, raising the bar as far as what we're trying to do as far as standards. I mean, the provincial legislation that we have out there ultimately sets the minimum standard that's acceptable for a lot of the infrastructure and the services we provide. And these strategies look to raise the bar. They also look to uh, perhaps change our approach. And I think underlying the Living Water Smart strategy is an approach that requires much more integration about how we go about our our, our thinking and and particularly integration with uh, land use, land use planning, uh, you know, and how that affects water and water <coughs> use. Um, particularly in integrating also the water quality and water and quantity pieces. So, um, and so within the Living Water Smart Strategy, there's a number of targets. Uh, I think this one is probably more pertinent for today, but uh, it, it does speak, I think, really specifically at how um, we really have to look at how we develop land and use land and how that affects uh, water quality. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the one thing I, I wanted to mention, and I, you know, they talked about uh, sort of the shared responsibility that, and I think that's why we're all here today is that, uh, you know, I think we see this as probably a good thing, um, and we're looking at ways that uh, we can ensure that we do protect stream health, uh, and uh, ultimately it, it does require leadership and, and, and champions on the ground. Uh, we look to the people in, in this room to, to be some of those champions and leaders. Um, and, I, and I guess, I guess, lastly, I just uh, a little uh, opportunity here to talk about what I do. Um, I know I know some of you, but uh, uh, in my my day job, I'm responsible for a lot of the uh, uh, local government uh, capital grants that are available. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is integrate uh, and integrate some of these strategies into the programs that we deal with. And so ultimately, if I, I look at some of the grant programs in the past. Um, you know, I think one of the, the challenges or, or the criticisms of these grant programs is that they actually rewarded poor behavior. And I think a paradigm shift for us is that we're trying to shift to look at a much more holistic approach, um, and that's the kind of thing that we want to reward with our grant program. So it's, it's not just the project itself, it's not just looking at a, a project and whether it's innovative, it's looking at the, the whole system uh, that includes things as, as high up as a regional growth strategy and how that links down and is connected down to implementation strategies, whether that's uh, bylaws or what have you, and then the project itself that falls out of all that. And that's what we're looking to try to reward. Basically, I guess the, the message is that we're trying to reward good behavior. And, uh, and, and this sort of helps provide some of the framework that uh, allows us to move forward uh, and uh, perhaps build some of that infrastructure on the ground that helps protect the stream health. So I think that's all I have to say, so I can like, keep, sh keep short. Well, thank, thank you, Carrie. And, and uh, Glenn will be very much part of the afternoon program. So what we're trying to accomplish through, through this program, and let me know if I'm blocking people's view what the sign is. Don't worry about these guys. I'll just block them off right now. In terms, of, in terms of some of the phrases that have come out through this process in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, consistency at the front counter. And what we mean by that is in terms of what we're trying to accomplish with this, this series, the two series, you know, first in the couch and now in the co is that 
not only will you have interdepartmental alignment, but then intermunicipal alignment in terms of people having the same message, the same understanding, so that there is consistency when people are coming, you know, when developers are, who are operating in different communities are coming forward for their, their projects, if they're hearing the same message, that, that's an important part of what we're trying to accomplish here. So in terms of the curriculum, because remember this is a this is a continuing education program, so you can get credits, you know, in terms of professional engineers or planners, whatever, for, for your participation. In terms of the of, of, of the of the progression, you know, uh, not to uh, repeat too much of what uh, Eric said, but you know, the first first uh, first session really, which was just uh, setting people's minds about uh, you know the expectations of today are becoming the standards of tomorrow, and we did have a walkabout to kind of get in people's mind what we're talking about by going through a uh, we Glen in terms of the uh, uh, East Kootenai, or East Courtney rather. And then today, with really being built around uh, Susan and the, and the legal strategy, and I'll explain more about Susan's background later on. And where we're building to as a month from now is really putting it into a regional context. So just to refresh for those who were here and those who are new, what we did accomplish last time, what people learned was this, this transition from single-purpose stormwater management to multi-objective rainwater management. And then another key message was to get to the big picture, it starts with the smallest pieces. And that's really part of the theme today, is, you know, is looking at the smallest pieces, because it's fine to have the high flu words and all that kind of stuff, but it's the actions on the ground at a site level that add up. And, you know, what we see up to now is cumulative impacts, but we, what we believe is the flip side of a problem is an opportunity, and so those cumulative impacts can become cumulative benefits if you do things differently. And um, the last thing we focused on, on, on last week was the, was the Stormer Guidebook. Um, this document here, which was published in 2002, and I was the project manager and primary author, and the chair of the Guidebook Steering Committee was Mr. Peter Law. Mr. Martin. Everyone knows you, don't they, Peter? Hi, hi, Peter, hi. Anyway, he was a great chair, and it was a, it was a, it was a great document because we were forward-looking at that time, and so now we have the benefit of six years of experience and the lessons we've learned and the adjustments we can make, and that started to be reflected in how we're approaching things today. So in terms of today, in terms of your learning outcomes, well, there's three things. One is, <coughs> some of you have already got your green infrastructure guide. I guess the rest of them will get it later on. Right? Yes. And like this. Yes. So that's a document that Susan authored. And that will become a very valuable resource to you. I know that you know Derek, Derek kept saying we're going to have this paperless series, but we said, but we've got to give them some things. You can't expect them to download it all. <laughs> <laughs> and as Peter can tell you, that was one of the issues with, with, with the guidebook. Because remember, originally, yeah, here, the guidebook was only available by downloading, and that causes actually a lot of problems, didn't it? Because at some point, you actually have to be able to give people a paper copy. <laughs> and um, really, what, another message will be about accepting risks when choosing a new path and looking for the benefits from the result. That was really one of uh, Susan's key messages coming out of the uh, uh, the Couch and series. So what we try to do here is capture some of the key messages from before and how we bring them forward. And uh, the third bullet, um, being uh, you know after after you told your story at Couch and and, and uh, when we were debriefing, and uh, remember Kate Miller said, you know, there was some great things that Dean said, but you know in terms of the building inspectors, how many building inspectors here today? One, two, good. Okay, we have a couple. But the simple message that, that you said but maybe didn't quite resonate was, if, the, if it's a dirty site, then no inspection. And you'll be elaborating on this point when we get into the uh, after the discussion. So these are your three kind of learning outcomes today that kind of guide how we're, how we're moving forward with the, uh, with the presentation of information. So looking ahead to November 21st, we're going to pull it all together in terms of a, of a, of a regional framework for this ballot, the Lox ballot. And so then we hope that everyone here will be We'll be back uh, doing the kind of Comox scan. So Glenn, you're here. Who else was from Comox? Marvin. Right. So good. Good. Okay. So this is all part of you know, uh, how we're going to pull it together, and uh, the theme will be uh, nature knows no boundaries. And uh, Kevin's always got these great slides of street intersections where you're able to say there's three jurisdictions of that intersection, right? Yeah. So Glenn, I have talked at you for a few minutes, and now. We want to get to know you better because again, this is going to be an interactive day. I'm just a warm up act. So we're going to go around the room. We want to know your name and your organization and your department, but we also want to know why you came today, what your expectations are today, as as Derek said. So then, at the end of the day, we can reflect back on whether we met your expectations. <coughs> and 
Lastly, who did their homework exercise from last, last week? Tom, did you do it? He did it. Oh, oh good. Oh, who else did it? Who else's hand went up? Glenn. Glenn. Oh, good. Well, maybe we'll give, them, we'll give them the opportunity to have more than 15 seconds to give us their feedback on their on their homework. What do you think, Derek? Absolutely. Because the homework exercise was to look at the the the, 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 uh, the uh, the guy. Uh, was interested in some groundwater issues. So. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Dean. Thank, thank you, thank you, everybody. And uh, I mean, this is really helpful because I think you know it helps us get to know you, it helps you get to know everybody else. And because this is very, very much going to be as we as the day unfolds in a town hall mode, because it's the sharing. So uh, this is good. This is good. And uh, there's some few things I want to pick up on just uh, before I move on. By the end of the day, you'll all be saying rainwater management, not stormwater management, because. They're different. <laughs> well, that's the last time you'll hear me say the S words. <laughs> anyway, but today is all about, you know, about expectations. So that's why the morning is establishing expectations, and the afternoon is is um, delivering. And so, uh, just kind of stepping back, remember our theme here is create little communities and protect stream health. So it is a function of what do we want our communities to look like, and you know, what our communities look like reflect our our engineering practices, our green infrastructure practices, and that's so having we'll set that context so that in the afternoon that we get into how do we how do we get there? And that's the significance of, of the legal and policy strategy. That, 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 that. So, just bring us right back to very basics again, just to finish off my segment here, which is you know when we talk about where and how land has developed, well. It's impacting on both the supply and the runoff side. So when you think of water sustainability, it's how water is used. And this is this is the can you see Tom? I think I saw you saw this before. I'm just gonna repeat a few of what I said last week, but you know when we get into talking about and as examples the city of Courtney experience and, and the soil depth policy, I mean that one foot of soil has huge implications in the sense that, you know, if you have good soil and you have well rooted uh, vegetation. Thing, and using less water in the summer, so that's a direct relationship with sustainability of supply, especially when you look at uh, what, I forget which, what number it is in terms of living water smart about um, uh, achieving 50% uh, reduction in water use. Or 50% of municipal supply will come from through water saving conservation. conservation, right? And also, as Glenn will tell you as, we, as the day goes on, um, there is no grant money for those who have a supply side way of building things, right? It's, <laughs> I mean, the money is being used to leverage change. And on the, on the other side, which is as water runs off, well, if you have the sponge, water doesn't run off as much, and you don't have that same, those same impacts on the water courses. So again, very simple thinking. Where and how land is developed determines the supply side, the runoff side. So what we've been doing through the whole county program is establishing this hierarchy of language where we you know, talk about green value, design with nature, Green infrastructure and water sustainability, but they're they're kind of cascading. But um, the green value, the way, the way I look at it, is really green value. When we use that terminology, is really appealing to the to the, the development community. That as, as a result of doing things better and differently, that will result in value, which will that will be reflected in their bottom line. From a municipal point, this is really what uh, Gary and, and Dean will get into is it's designed with nature, you know, consistent with McCarg's book back in the late '60s in terms of how you look at the landscape and. Uh, you probably could write this as a landscaper, right? You probably, anyway, but coming out of that is your green infrastructure policies and practices, because that's what results in the water sustainability, you know, the sustainability of the water, and that's why I had that first slide, which is you gotta think about the inside and the, um, and the offside. At the end of the day, your green infrastructure practices have a direct bearing on your water sustainability. So again, in terms of reminding you of what we said last time, in terms of the mantra of, of the new business as usual, doing things differently, why are we doing it? We're trying to visualize what this place will look like in 50 years because the, the decisions that you that one makes today in local government they ripple through time and a lot of times you don't see the impacts uh, for, for quite a while so again coming back to those that impacts or benefits those those decisions that one lot of time the one piece of property at a time make a difference and so if you start thinking differently about design with nature and in terms of what you're trying to achieve which is a livable community and protecting stream health that's how you get there and uh, just one kind of sidebar there, when you talk about, say, trees and streetscapes, you know, you don't plant the trees because you want to intercept rain. 
you plant trees because it makes it a, a more friendly uh, street to walk in. So that's the kind of way we have to be thinking. So again, just reiterating about what does the new business as usual mean in terms of water sustainability will be achieved through implementing green infrastructure policies and practices. That's kind of a key, key message. So beyond the guidebook, again, reflecting our lessons learned. Which one is it now? It's not a very big document because really it's, a, it's just capturing some philosophy, but it's it's part of the branding is the fact that we do have a guidebook. It has been six years. We have learned a lot. Well, have we, Peter? And, it, and it's how we move forward, not by publishing guidebooks, but by having events like today where you share the experiences and you learn from each other. Again, think about what's the ultimate objective. It's create local communities, changing the way you develop the land, and in the process, protect stream health. So, Here's a more of a definition of, of, of design with nature. And you know, in this, this era of change and climate change, it's really important to come back to these basic definitions as to why we're using this language, and how a design with nature approach is a key to climate change adaptation. Because so much, well, in terms of climate change, mitigation is carbon, right? That's greenhouse gases. But on the adaptation side, it's all about water. Because if you think about it, it's always about floods, you know, droughts, changes in patterns. And so it's how we, how, we're, how we manage water, which is a reflection of what we do on the land, that impacts or, or will drive our, our climate change strategy. So in terms of, of the elements of a design with nature way of thinking, develop compact and thick communities. I mean, you're, you're hearing more of this. And I think uh, this will probably come up more in when we do session number three. We wanted uh, Kevin and Derek in terms of, of how, how you know, the plans being developed. Am I blocking your view too many? OK. Um, Transportation options. I can't help think back to last year's uh, showcasing series when we had the uh, we had the bus right here for in, 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 in uh, uh, so the so the bus route from Campbell River to Courtney having the uh, internet access and uh, as a result of showcasing and, and people hearing in other parts of the, of the region about uh, you know the trailblazing by this valley in terms of having internet access on bus. Well, they're doing it now down in um, Langford and in View Royal. And it's one of those things where you know, the idea started here, as far as I can tell. Um, reuse and recycle water, energy and nutrients from liquid wastes and wastes and location marks because it's a resource, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so there's a whole shift in thinking taking place because you know you have the 1992 the Liquid Waste Management Plan was was uh, or Liquid Waste Management Act was passed, and now uh, we'd like to change that to being the Liquid Resource Act. And where most, where a lot of our focus has been in terms of showcasing last year and this year has been on those last three bullets, which is really you know the protecting and restoring green space, and then striving for a lighter hydrologic footprint. And I got to give Craig Mount of the Capital Regional District when he was there some, several years ago as being the originator of that phrase, the light, you know, the hydrologic footprint, because I think five years ago when when he first coined it, it didn't really resonate with people. But I think you've heard so much of late, the last year and a half or so of ecological footprints, et cetera, et cetera, that probably is becoming more intuitively obvious to people what we mean by the a lighter hydrologic footprint, because that's the key to achieving higher levels of watershed and stream and wetland protection. So <coughs> that leads me to talk about convening for action and why we're here. Right? Tom, this is the slide from last time, so do you remember it? The reason we say convening for action is because I guess we, there's, a, there's a number of us are over over 50 in this room, <laughs> and so we've we've heard a lot of talk over the over, over the decades, haven't we, Tom? And so we're putting down our careers where we say we have this 25 or 30 or 35 years worth of experience. And so when we get together, it's not just to talk. It's like, what are we going to do when we leave here? And that's part of the challenge for everybody here today. Is what are you going to do differently when you leave here today? And I think Kevin, you're going to pick up on this theme at the end of the day when we when we check back in with with expectations being met. So creating that picture of, of, of the future. So there's three three thoughts here. Vision, again, what we want this place to look like in 50 years. Because remember, 50 years is one house building cycle. Well, it used to be 50, one house building cycle. These days, maybe it's only it's going to be two, the way things get knocked down. But still, it's you know it's easy to talk about the what and then the goal. What's the goal? Well, the right now, the goal is to implement the new business as usual. So what? And I think it's important to, at this point, you're Quite back to your comments, Len, which is we now have provincial direction, as of you know, within the last six months especially. The language is now in place in 
terms of what? When do we want to achieve this province, which is to look ahead? So, you know, a year or two ago, people would say, well, what's, 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 what's driving it? Well, um, where's the piece of paper? You know, where's, where's the legislation? Where's, you know, what's the policy statement? Well, we have the policy framework at the highest level now, and really what we're talking about today is what it means, what you're doing on the ground, how we will get there, but the vision is set in terms of looking for uh, to maintain the quality of life that we have today to ensure that it is here 50 years from now. So vision, goal, strategy, what are we going to do better or differently to get from where we are today to where we want to be? And that's the whole what, so what, now what mind frame, because we're very good at talking about you know, what the problem is or so what, what, so what should we do? But we've had a lot of difficulties getting from so what to now what are we going to do? And Really, that was at the core of the guy that wasn't where we talked about the mind map of how are we going to move from talk to action. And that's actually what we've seen in the last six years. We have moved from talk to action. That's why British Columbia is a leader. That's why we're doing better than Washington State. They're in crisis mode, right? So that, that mind map of vision, you know, uh, goal, vision, goal, strategy really leads me into, into introducing Dean and Gary and the Inland Kenworth case study because. This really has become for us on the island a defining example, a, design, defi a defining illustration of when design with nature meets green value. And that's the story that you guys are going to tell. And, and this is a slide that I prepared uh, last year for the, for the Green Infrastructure Leadership Forum where we brought together the elected officials of the island. And capturing some of the sound bites your presentation back in uh, back in September of, of, of a year ago of how it symbolized the turning of the tide in Nanaimo in terms of expectations, expectations that the city has for the development community and the development the consulting community in Nanaimo and how you challenged them to dare to be different. And I <coughs> include this slide because yeah, a year ago we did, you know, the city of Nanaimo and the regional district of Nanaimo were the co-hosts for the first of the three showcasing events we had. We, kept, we started off in, in Nanaimo, two weeks later we were in Couch Valley, and then we finished up um, here in, 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 in Courtney uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Kevin and, and uh, the regional district being the co-hosts here. And after we did the, uh, the Nanaimo event, I just, by pure fluke, I was on, on, on the internet and I stumbled across this reference to Inland Kenworth and uh, an online trucking magazine. And this was the, this was the, this was the quote from, from the president. And in the article, it was, it was talking about their participation in the showcasing series and, and kind of the good feelings that had been created by that. So again, it just underscores the fact that I think you'll elaborate on this much, uh, uh, Dean, in terms of they paid a bit of a premium in this case, or, or did they? But the mileage that they've gotten from doing things differently has, has been reflected in their, in their bottom line. And I think you're going to talk about between the, Kevin, you're probably going to interject here in terms of uh, when, when Dean tells a story about the common link between what we saw in Nanaimo with Inland Kenworth and the city of Courtney and projects here with, with car dealerships and then the district of uh, North Couch and how it's all about individuals and individuals being champions. In this case, we focused on an individual who's representing the development community and the impact he's having in doing his projects differently. So on that note, guys,